Okay, so let's uh, get to the talk. Um, so uh, we all know that uh, planar, finite planar, gra planar graphs can be represented in the plane by uh, polygons. And uh, this uh, generalizes to any graph if we step one dimension higher. So any finite graph can be represented in at least three dimensions by polyhedra. What do we mean by such a representation? So every for every vertex, there stands a polyhedron, and two of them share a, a face if and only if the two vertices are adjacent. Now, our question is for motivation. Uh, I am trying to motivate uh, the, the, the main question, which is coming from Itai uh, in the coming few slides. So what happens for infinite graphs? So suppose we have a G, an infinite transitive graph, and we want to uh, represent it by domains or polyhedra in, uh, in the spa Euclidean space. But since the graph has, uh, it is transitive, it has some nice symmetries, we would like this representation to preserve either the symmetries of the graph or the symmetries of the Euclidean space somehow. So this is the, the meta question. Uh, oops. Uh, red, red. Uh, try the other ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's not so important actually. I can it use. Works. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> also the pointer. So, um, of course, the nicest, simplest case is uh, a tiling, a periodic tiling. But that is a very lucky is instance that won't happen for most uh, transitive graphs. So how would we, should we generalize our setup a bit so that we still have something uh, as nice, uh, well, uh, uh, useful, yeah. Uh, now, let's introduce invariant random tilings. So I will give a, you, you, I think you can all guess what it means. I would like to give a, an, uh, an example too, because we, which you also all know, but, but it will be useful for, for the later. And um, so an invariant random tiling gives rise to a, a random uh, graph, which also has some uh, uh, nice properties. Uh, for example, it is uh, unimodular. Uh, but um, so uh, uh, here is an example for, for an, uh, an isometry invariant random tiling of the plane. Take some isometry invariant point process, for example, the Poisson point, point process, and define the Voronoi uh, tiling on it. So for every point of the space, we will allocate uh, the a configuration point which is closest to it. And uh, uh, one uh, feature of this uh, uh, rule of defining this tiling is that we only have to use some local rule. So uh, for any point, if we look around in a large enough neighborhood of it and uh, check out the, the, the configuration points in that neighborhood, uh, uh, we will be able to tell its style up to uh, arbitrary uh, precision. Uh, and, and because of this uh, having, being defined by such a local rule, the tiling is also isometric invariant, so it inherits uh, that property from uh, the, the point process. And so, uh, and so here is the, the next idea. Let's uh, try to find uh, uh, random tilings that are isometry invariant and represent uh, our fixed uh, graph G in the Euclidean space. And uh, for later, we will allow unbounded domains. And the next definition, which I, I'm not really going to define uh, what we mean by indistinguishability of domains, but I will give a heuristic to it, and later I will define this notion for uh, graphs instead of domains uh, more rigorously. So, uh, let's say that we have a random ergodic tiling, and uh, uh, consider properties that, are, uh, that can hold for a, for a tile, and that is uh, defined internally somehow. So it doesn't use some external reference point, but uh, pr properties of the tile uh, that um, 
that 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 uh, characterize it somehow uh, more globally. So here are a few examples that are listed. The fact whether the tile is bounded or unbounded is, is one example. Uh, or uh, we ca uh, if it has a, uh, a density, or if we take the upper or lower density of the tile in the space, or uh, various topological properties of, of the tile. These are uh, such pot possible properties. So again, once uh, properties that are defined internally. And we will say that uh, uh, okay, I, I haven't uh, defined indistinguishability yet. So uh, we say that uh, a random tiling is uh, uh, satisfies indistinguishability if, for any such property, either all the tiles uh, belong uh, uh, satisfy that property almost surely, or none of them. Okay, and so this is somehow this, uh, the generalization of having congruent tiles in the per periodic setup which was a very uh, uh, strong restriction, but in this uh, randomized setup, this, uh, and for unbounded ties, this seems to be the right generalization. If we had bounded ties, then indistinguishability was, apart from some aperiodic tilings, it would lead to periodic uh, ties. Uh, so a, a, a slightly stronger version of indistinguishability would lead to Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, it didn't make too much sense in the way I said it. But <laughs> if we, if we, if we uh, 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 define indistinguishability in a stronger sense, so we not only look at the property of the tile, but also what is around it, then uh, uh, indistinguishable tiling by bounded uh, domains is exactly uh, the periodic tilings. Now, um, where, uh, uh, so, so here is the final form of our question. We want to find an uh, invariant random tiling with indistinguishable tiles that would represent uh, our um, infinite transitive graph G. Now, uh, in case of the plane, the question is not so interesting. Planarity is already an obstacle. But, uh, okay, let's uh, take a look at the three regular infinite tree. Uh, that's a planar graph. Uh, Burton and Keen has shown that it cannot be represented uh, in the plane by indistinguishable domains. Okay, uh, I think I should have written uh, z, z squared there. Uh, I, I, I didn't check if it extends to r squared. But uh, the discrete version for, for the discrete version of this question, there is a, uh, the answer is negative. This is not the paper that Tom mentioned, but another one by these two authors. And um, so, uh, uh, okay, and, and one more remark. So, indistinguishability is certainly needed for this negative result. Otherwise, we are able to represent a regular tree in the plane invariantly. So, look at this pattern, continue it uh, to the uh, lo uh, smaller and the large scale, and take some random uh, shifts on, of this pattern, we get uh, the five regular tree uh, by an invariant, uh, as an invariant domain representation. Uh, and and the, the, but here the, the ties are distinguishable because there are ties that have si uh, a diameter less than one and ties that have diameter uh, larger than one. So here is the question that Itai asked. Um, so if we move uh, one dimension uh, up in R cube, is it possible to represent the three regular tree by uh, indistinguishable domains invariantly? And uh, I think that what uh, most people uh, to whom he told this question expected was a negative answer, uh, partly because of what we have seen in the two-dimensional case, and also if we wanted the domains to have a, a finite measure, then uh, it would be uh, impossible to, uh, to, have, to find such a, a tiling. So the, this is the uh, intuition why uh, we, we, we would think that the answer is negative, but actually it turned out that um, there is uh, such a, a tiling, and 
uh, in the rest of this talk, I, I will uh, sketch the proof uh, for this uh, theorem. And uh, one of the tools that we are going to use is the following theorem. So if we have an amenable transitive graph, Tom has uh, defined amenability already, uh, so, uh, but, but recall, uh, so a, a, a graph is non-amenable if uh, there is a positive constant C such that any, uh, connected sub, uh, any finite subset has boundary of size at least uh, C times the uh, inside, the, the volume. So that was the definition of non-amenability. And so for an amenable G, uh, there is a way to represent it in uh, the Euclidean space invariantly and using bounded polyhedra. So once again, the setup in the theorem 1 and 2 is different. In, uh, for theorem 1, we want indistinguishable polyhedra, which, is o which only makes sense for unbounded ones. Uh, only, uh, that's the, the non-trivial case. In theorem 2, we have uh, bounded polyhedra. And here we have a minimal G, and uh, in theorem one uh, we have a non amenable one. What is the in positive measure, you cannot succeed before. And but uh, that, that's for the for uh, the tree, for the regular tree. Uh, so so finite. finite measure. With finite measure tiles, uh, one can show that uh, one cannot represent an, uh, uh, a non amenable uh, G. Yes. Yes. So, in a way, this theorem uh, characterizes uh, amenability through uh, the existence of uh, uh, such a tiling with uh, uh, tiles of, uh, of finite measure. And so, uh, now first, I will uh, sketch the proof uh, for theorem two because uh, it will be uh, needed. Uh, it will be uh, modified for theorem uh, one, in a way. So let's uh, start with the, uh, the with the lemma, which has been. Uh, I, I think so. So there are um, more ways to prove it, but uh, perhaps the mo most elegant one was observed by Tom uh, Hutchcroft uh, uh, through through the fact that um, the, uh, measure preserving actions of uh, amenable uh, groups are uh, orbit equivalent, uh, but uh, so, so what does this lemma say? Uh, it says that if we have uh, two uh, Cayley graphs uh, or Cayley diagrams, by a Cayley diagram I mean a Cayley graph where we keep the generators that gave rise from, uh, from the group to the, the, the graph, we keep the generators as labelings on the edges and keep the orientations of the edges. That's, that's when I will say a uh, Cayley diagram. Uh, and and the, the important distinction why we will sometimes switch to Cayley diagrams is that the, the stabilizer of every vertex is trivial for a Cayley diagram. Uh, that's the property that we, we will need sometimes. But anyhow, so if we have uh, 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 two amenable uh, Cayley graphs, then we can draw a copy, a random copy of one of them, so say a random copy of G, uh, of H, on the vertices of G in such a way that this random copy is invariant under out G. What do you okay. mean the vertices of G? I mean, if you forget about the edges of G, then it's just a countable set, right? Yes, so just to draw it on the vertices, is, uh, it, it is obviously uh, possible. But here, the, this, this random drawing will be such that it is invariant uh, under uh, the automorphisms of G. So we decorate G with H. They may look very different. So it's, uh, it's very hard to imagine how the, two, the decoration would lo look like. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and still, this, this, the, this random decoration with this fixed graph is such that uh, it, it is invariant. And now, uh, here, here is the sketchy proof of theorem 2. So, uh, first, uh, just embed uh, z cubed 
into the Euclidean space uh, invariantly by choosing a random translation and random rotation. Now, on Z cube, we have an invariant copy of G by the lemma. So let's uh, fix G to be an, any amenable uh, transitive uh, calligraph. And so this invariant copy of G on Z cube gives an invariant copy of G on some random point set, or well, the, the points of Z cube in, in R, R cubed. Sorry, this should be 3. And now this, so far we only have the points and the graph defined on them in the Euclidean space, and everything is invariant. Now we can make this graph actually be embedded in the space. That, that is possible. I, I won't go into the details. Then that graph can be transformed into domains, again, using some local rules, which, is, uh, which won't hurt invariance if we do it cleverly enough. And now we have uh, already a representation of the graph by uh, tiles, but we, we still have this infinite tile uh, outside of uh, them, which we want to make disappear. And that is also possible by uh, some local algorithm. In, in a sequence of steps. So that's the, the very sketchy proof. Now, how do we uh, go from theorem 2, so from this uh, result uh, about uh, the, uh, representing amenable graphs uh, as, a uh, as a tiling, to theorem 1? Uh, so again, we know that amenable graphs can be represented by an invariant tiling with bounded tiles, and we want to represent T3 by indistinguishable tiles. So the way we will do it, so we will use a, a, a fact that was first observed by Gaborio in the context of, of this question uh, by Itai. So if we take the Bumstock solitaire group uh, 1, 2, uh, uh, the, then it, it has a uh, an interesting property that one can uh, read off uh, from this picture. So if we take these orange uh, fibers, uh, uh, then the, the graph that, uh, that is inherited, uh, so, so if we define a graph on the fibers uh, through what, what they inherit from the original uh, Cayley graph of, of, uh, of uh, G, is, uh, is the three regular tree. So, uh, okay, uh, maybe this was a bit too fast. Let's, let's take a look at, at the Cayley graph of this, uh, uh, this group. At first sight, it may look like uh, the three regular tree direct product with, with Z, but in fact, this is not the case because every line, every fiber is connected to two fibers in the next generation, and every even vertex goes to one of them and every odd vertex to the other one, okay? So, but still we have this tree structure on this uh, graph, but it is also, uh, but, but it happens to be amenable. And now, so now let's uh, uh, go from theorem two to theorem one as follows. We have a, a representation of this G that I have just showed you in uh, R cubed by right, invariant domains. Now let's take uh, the union of the domains that correspond to one fiber, do it over all fibers, and we get the representation of T3. The only missing part is why would these unions of these domains the, uh, over the fibers why would they give indistinguishable ties? Okay, that, that's, that's the question. And it may look innocent, but uh, indistinguishability uh, can, can be difficult to prove. For example, the, the, the paper of uh, Rass and uh, Odette Schramm, uh, where uh, they are uh, proving... Um, the indistinguishability of, of uh, the infinite clusters of, of uh, certain percolation uh, processes uh, such as Bernoulli percolation, 
uh, is, is a, a, a famous and, and, and tricky paper. So, uh, and, and also, if with the ab above sketch of proof, if we just apply it to any uh, uh, tiling that represents G, the Baumstark solitaire group, uh, without care, then we may get uh, distinguishable ties at the end. So, this sketch of proof is not enough for the, the result that we want. Um, and so, in the remainder uh, of this talk, I, I will modify it so that it works and, and we get indistinguishable ties. Now, here is a definition that you all know. Uh, let calligraphic G be the uh, set of uh, uh, bounded degree, uh, no, finite degree rooted graphs up to, up to rooted isomorphism. And define the, the two, two, let two be, graphs be close if the, our neighborhoods are uh, rooted equivalent. Uh, now, the, one can extend this, uh, notion, uh, this uh, distance to decorated graphs. So, Russ and all those uh, defined uh, marked graphs, this is a bit uh, more uh, uh, general, what, what the notion of decorated graphs that we will need. So, suppose we have some graph, we can add some decoration to the vertices or to the edges. We can also add extra edges and keep track of which are the extra edges and which are the original ones, and also add decoration on the extra edges if we wish. And then we can even add extra vertices and extra edges on them, and then we can even decorate those extra uh, vertices. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like there is a little birthday party organized for you on this graph. Uh, so this is the, uh, the we all know all these extra um, decorations when we talk about decorated graphs. And now, uh, so uh, I think uh, it's, it's clear that the, uh, this uh, topology or this metric that we define for rooted graphs extends to rooted decorated graphs with some care. Now, this will be particularly interesting to us when we take some subgraph of some underlying graph, say a Cayley graph, and we will think about the Cayley graph as the decoration. So we will have this subgraph, say this red graph, and then uh, the entire uh, remaining uh, graph will be thought of as a, a decoration, and, and this uh, setup we will call a scenery around this uh, subgraph. And uh, this example shows that, uh, for example, two, two uh, subgraphs may, may be uh, isomorphic, but with scenery they are not, because the isomorphism should also preserve this extra uh, external edges. Okay, um, now, uh, so on this space of uh, uh, rooted graphs or rooted decorated graphs, if we fix the space of decorations, uh, one can define uh, 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 probability measures and uh, Aldous and Russ introduced the notion of unimodularity for such uh, probability measures. I won't uh, define it here, but uh, we will uh, see how they are connected to uh, invariant percolation on Cayley um, graphs. So if you don't know the notion, uh, you still uh, will get uh, the, the point, hopefully. Now, so consider some uh, Borel uh, subset of this set of rooted graphs. And suppose that it is changed by, uh, it is closed uh, under changing the root. So if we have a rooted graph in A, then by moving the root to some other vertex, we are still in A. And so we will consider such properties. 
And we say that the unimodular random graph is external, uh, extremal or ergodic if for any such A, either almost surely uh, the, the random graph is, uh, satisfies this property is in A, or almost surely it is not. Um, so this is the uh, extremality for unimodular graphs. And this corresponds to indistinguishability of um, percolation clusters. So if we have some invariant percolation, we can just think about it as a, a random unimodular graph with decoration, where the, the unimodular graph is the, the component of the origin, and everything outside it is thought of as a decoration. So that's how we get a decorated graph from uh, the cluster of the origin in an invariant percolation. And we have defined extremality or ergodicity for unimodular random graphs on the previous slide. That, will, uh, uh, that can be used to define indistinguishability of the clusters uh, through, through this correspondence. So, uh, for example, uh, let, let's see, suppose that we have some percolation where there are clusters, uh, as on this picture, with positive probability, both of them show up. So, in particular, it, this uh, percolation fails to uh, satisfy indistinguishability. Then, with positive probability, the root, the, the, the cluster of, uh, uh, with positive probability, the unimodular graph looks like this. With positive probability, it looks like this. And um, uh, so, in particular, we, we get that it was not uh, ergodic. Now, uh, so, sorry, but, uh, until when uh, is my. Uh, you have until four. So okay. Thank you. Um, One three. <laughs> also. Uh, okay, now uh, let G be uh, some Cayley graph or Cayley diagram. The next, um, I, I coined this name, uh, decoration lemma for it. So suppose that there is some. Uh, random uh, partition of G uh, Cayley graph into pieces, and suppose that these pieces are indistinguishable. Now, let's apply some extra decoration on it, which is a factor of IID. Oh, uh, did I define factor of IID? Oh, man. I want, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I think I, I erased that slide by chance. Um, but uh, it was defined by Jeff, actually, by, uh, what he called uh, Bernoulli, his factor of IID. So we, we flip uh, some, uh, we have some uniform, uh, or Lebesgue 0, 1, uh, random variables on every vertex of G, and uh, a function that uh, assigns uh, to, to every vertex some label is called factor of IID if it uses these uh, random uh, uh, labels around that vertex. Uh, so, uh, but what, uh, what we saw at the Voronoi uh, tessellation, the way it was defined, is a similar idea. There we were using the randomness, uh, the location of the other configuration points as the rule to define the ties. And uh, in case of a factor of IID, we used the uh, these uh, extra random variables on the vertices to, um, to define, uh, to, to assign uh, some new labels to the vertices. Now, the lemma says that if we have some uh, indistinguishable pieces in this uh, random partition, then any factor of IID decoration will also give uh, indistinguishable pieces. And now the second uh, lemma that we will need, I call the duality lemma. 
and it says the following. If we have a, so suppose that we have two uh, Cayley graphs, G and H, sorry, two Cayley diagrams. Here it's important that they are diagrams, G and H, and we can draw a random copy of H on the vertices of G. Uh, note that in that case, we can also think about uh, that as a random copy of G drawn on a fixed copy of H. So the lemma says that if this random copy of H drawn on G was out G invariant, then the, random, the, then the, the copy of G that it determines on H is invariant under the automorphisms of H. This uh, little um, visual trick uh, is supposed to illustrate uh, this uh, phenomenon. And uh, so now with these two lemmas, we are ready to, to fix uh, the proof of theorem 1 or the sketch of proof in such a way that we also have uh, indistinguishability of the domains by the end. So, uh, so let's take a Cayley diagram of, of G equal to this Baumstock solitaire group and the Cayley diagram of Z cubed. By the lemma that I already quoted, there is this decoration of G by the edges of Z cubed or a factor of IID uh, map from G to Z cubed, which we can think of as a, an extra copy of Z cubed on, on the vertices of G. And also, uh, through this uh, process that we sketched at the proof of theorem 2, if we have uh, okay, so fr from this copy of Z cubed on G, we also get a copy of G on Z cubed. This is a bijection, so we can uh, think about it as uh, edges of G being on Z cubed. And through the process that we saw at the proof of theorem 2, we can uh, define uh, domains around each vertex of Z cubed such that the domains represent the adjacencies uh, coming from G. So these domains define G uh, by the end. This is essentially uh, what we have had for the sketch of uh, proof of uh, theorem 1 before uh, uh, with more details. Now what we were longing for is that the union, so the, if we look at the composed images of the fibers, they, those should be indistinguishable uh, domains in, uh, in, the, in R cube, in the space. And so why is that true? So we want, the, uh, so once again, we want the union of the domains that correspond to the fibers to be indistinguishable for, from each other. Well, uh, uh, the, so the, the reason that they are indistinguishable is because we, we could get them as factor of IID decoration on the fibers of G. So both alpha and beta are factor of IID maps. So if we look, look at this, these domains together with what's, all the domains outside of them as the decorations on the fibers, from the decoration lemma, we know that they have to be indistinguishable because the fibers are already trivially indistinguishable in G. So we got the indistinguishability. Now, one more uh, problem or, or issue here is that we wanted these domains to be invariant by the, under the isometries, but in fact, through the construction, we only have them invariant as decorations on G with respect to the automorphisms of G. 
But because of the duality lemma, we get that uh, if we define them on z cube, then uh, through the duality lemma, then we also get that uh, they are indistinguishable. And, um, and, and that's it. Um, that, that finishes the, the, this uh, sketchy proof. Let me mention that uh, by a similar method, one uh, can also show that for any amenable graph, there is a, a representation by indistinguishable domains. So in theorem 2, we had uh, bounded domains, but we can also do it with indistinguishable domains. And uh, finally, two open questions. One is, so we have, we have in this, uh, uh, representation by indistinguishable domains for, for amenable uh, 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 transitive uh, graphs. We had it for the regular tree. Is it true for, for any Cayley graph that there is such a representation? And another question is an alternative version that it I asked whether uh, in Z cube one can do the same uh, construction um, with the proper adjustment of definitions. So thank you very much for your attention.